Hello, my name is Brent Reed, and the following presentation is an overview of pulmonary arterial hypertension. To begin, pulmonary hypertension, or PH, is a clinical syndrome characterized by narrowing of the pulmonary arteries. The increased pressure that often results can produce enlargement of the right ventricle and, in many advanced cases, right ventricular failure. The World Health Organization, or WHO, categorizes pulmonary hypertension into five groups, all of which are characterized by an elevation in mean pulmonary artery pressure. Group 1 patients are those with pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PAH, which will be the focus of this presentation. Group 2 is the largest category and represents those who have pulmonary hypertension as a result of left heart disease and an increase in pulmonary pressure that often results. Group 3 are those with pulmonary hypertension due to chronic lung diseases, and Group 4 represents those with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, or CTEF. Group 5 is a category that represents miscellaneous etiologies, or those where a single cause is difficult to determine. Like patients with chronic heart failure, those with PAH can also be classified according to the severity of their symptoms. The WHO functional classification system mirrors the New York Heart Association classification for patients with heart failure. Those with WHO class 1 disease have no symptoms with exercise, whereas those with class 2 and 3 disease have slightly limited and markedly limited physical activity, respectively. Finally, those with class 4 disease have severely limited activity and symptoms at rest. Several processes are implicated in the pathophysiology of PAH, as illustrated in this example pulmonary arteriole. An imbalance of physiologic vasoconstrictors and vasodilators leads to net vasoconstriction of the pulmonary smooth muscle. Inflammatory mediators, such as leukocytes, are also often involved. Platelet aggregation and thrombosis may occur as a consequence of alterations in physiologic blood flow or due to imbalances in physiologic coagulation pathways. Finally, over the long term, altered concentrations of these mediators result in pathologic changes to the structure of the vasculature, often referred to as remodeling. Before we talk about specific therapies used in PAH, let's briefly go through how the disease is managed overall. Most patients will be considered for a number of general supportive measures, such as oxygen and diuretic therapy, which we will discuss shortly. Currently, it is still recommended that patients with PAH undergo vasoreactivity testing. Those with positive vasoreactivity is determined by a decrease in mean pulmonary artery pressure of greater than or equal to 10 to an absolute mean pressure of less than or equal to 40 may be considered for high-dose calcium channel blocker therapy. However, most patients will either not respond or not have a sustained response over time and will require disease-modifying therapies such as phosphodiesterase inhibitors or endothelin antagonists. Further disease progression warrants the use of sequential combination therapy. Advanced therapies include balloon atrial septostomy, where a hole is made between the atria to relieve right ventricular stress, and lung transplantation. Standard supportive therapies for patients with PAH include oxygen for those with hypoxemia and diuretics for those with volume overload. Digoxin may be considered to assist with right ventricular support and to prevent remodeling, although this latter use is largely hypothetical. As mentioned previously, calcium channel blockers may be used in patients with a positive vasoreactivity test. Finally, vitamin K antagonists are considered for many PAH patients due to their increased thromboembolic risk, although a lower INR range, such as 1.5 to 2.5, is generally targeted. The disease-modifying therapies work on one of three major pathways. The first is the endothelin pathway. Patients with PAH have excess circulating concentrations of endothelin-1, which leads to vasoconstriction and smooth muscle proliferation. Endothelin receptor antagonists, such as both Sintan, inhibit endothelin receptors to prevent this process. In the second pathway, nitric oxide acts as one of the body's physiologic vasodilators, and it also has antiproliferative effects. It acts via increased cyclic GMP concentrations. Exogenous nitric oxide may be administered to enhance this pathway, although this is primarily reserved for acutely ill patients. The guanylate cyclase stimulator, Riosigwat, may also be used to increase cyclic GMP production to enhance this pathway. 
Finally, cyclic GMP is broken down by phosphodiesterase type 5. So PDE5 inhibitors such as sildenafil can be used to prevent cyclic GMP degradation. Lastly, the prostacyclin pathway involves the production of prostacyclin, another endogenous vasodilator and antiproliferative that exerts its activity via enhanced cyclic AMP concentrations. Prostanoids, such as epiprostanol or triprostanil, may be used to augment this pathway in patients with PAH. The endothelin receptor antagonists include ambrosentan, bosentan, and masitentan. All three improve symptoms, disease state progression, and quality of life, and masitentan has also been associated with improvements in long-term outcomes, although this endpoint was driven primarily by improvements in time to clinical worsening and not survival. The three agents have a similar side effect profile, which includes headache, anemia, and peripheral edema. Edema appears to be worse with ambrosentan, and anemia worse with masitentan. Bosentan is also associated with transaminitis that requires frequent monitoring of liver function tests. Because of their complex interactions with the CYP450 enzyme system and other proteins, the endothelin receptor antagonists must be closely observed for drug-drug interactions. Finally, because of their teratogenicity, all three agents require that patients enroll in a REMS monitoring program. The phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors are the most commonly used class of drug in PAH due to their widespread availability and ease of use. Neither drug requires enrollment in a REMS program. Both sildenafil and tadalafil are approved for PAH and each has been shown to improve symptoms, progression, and quality of life. Sildenafil may be administered in doses of up to 80 mg three times daily, whereas tadalafil is dosed at 40 mg once daily. The two drugs have a similar adverse effect profile and both are generally well tolerated. Caution must be exerted with strong CYP3A4 interactions as both drugs are substrates of this enzyme system. As in other disease states, PDE5 inhibitors are contraindicated with nitrates. Importantly, their use is also contraindicated with the guanylate cyclase stimulator Riosigwat for similar reasons. Riosigwat improves PAH symptoms and quality of life and is improved for both PAH and CTEF. It is dosed three times daily, and lower starting doses may be used in patients who get hypotensive, whereas higher doses may be required in active smokers. The adverse effect profile of Riosigwat is similar to the PDE5 inhibitors, and it too is contraindicated with nitrates. Other drug-drug interactions have not been well characterized. Lower doses may be required in patients receiving strong CYP3A4 and peak glycoprotein inhibitors due to theoretical interactions. Like the endothelin receptor antagonist, Riosigwat is teratogenic, requiring that patients be enrolled in a REMS program. The prosinoids include traprosinol and epiprosinol. Traprosinol is available as an oral, inhaled, subcutaneous, or intravenous formulation, whereas epiprosinol is available only as an intravenous formulation. To date, IV epiprosinol is the only drug shown to improve survival in PAH. Both drugs are associated with improvements in symptoms and disease state progression. Despite the potential benefits associated with continuous infusions of epiprosinol or triprosinol, their use is generally reserved for severe PAH. Regardless of formulation, the drugs are generally started at low doses and titrated to the dose that can be maximally tolerated. Most of their adverse effects are vasodilation related, such as flushing, although GI complaints and bleeding are also commonly reported. Abrupt withdrawal, especially of the intravenous formulations, should be avoided as patients may decompensate rapidly. This is particularly true with epiprosinol given its half-life of only six minutes. Unlike many other disease states, selection of therapy in patients with PAH is driven more by drug-specific and patient-specific characteristics, such as route of administration, adverse effects, patient preference, and many of the other items listed here, rather than compelling differences in clinical outcomes. Oral therapy should certainly be used in patients who are symptomatic, and epiprosinol should be considered when the disease becomes advanced. However, beyond those two recommendations, the appropriate drug in each individual patient is unclear, and it's largely left to patient and provider discretion. An area of ongoing research is whether patients with PAH should have therapies added in a stepwise fashion as the disease progresses, or whether initial combination therapy should be considered, as is done in patients with heart failure. 
Combination therapy has been shown to improve clinical outcomes in retrospective studies, but data from randomized controlled trials are conflicting. Regardless of which strategy is selected, a goal-oriented approach appears to confer the greatest clinical benefit. Only the combination of PDE5 inhibitors and Riosigwat should be avoided. Otherwise, any of the combinations shown here represent an acceptable regimen. That concludes today's presentation on pulmonary arterial hypertension. Thank you for your attention.